myself in front of disembodied, literally, fingers and a bucket of body parts, it might surprise you to know that I thought, what have I gotten myself into? <clears throat> Murder mystery childhood aside, I went to the University of California, San Diego to become a marine biologist. About halfway through my degree, it occurred that a violently motion sensitive person should not be a marine anything. <laughs> so I decided on a new and exciting plan. I would go to law school and I would specialize in scientific patents. Yes, I know what you are thinking. Clearly, someone had dropped me on my head as a child. <clears throat> but I went forward with this very exciting plan, and I found myself employed at a paralegal firm after I graduated. Here is where I first began to practice a concept that would be a personal, professional staple of mine. Clarity of purpose. My clarity of purpose at that paralegal firm was to work there exactly long enough to convince my parents to send me to law school. <laughs> Unfortunately for me, I had not learned a second concept staple of my career, and that was connecting with your audience. This particular paralegal firm was staffed entirely by single women who either had disabled children, disabled siblings, or elderly parents to care for after they worked all day long as the sole breadwinners for their families. Three months in, it was clear. I should have absolutely nothing to do with anything related to files, briefs, collating. I could not even get the mail into the right slots. And as I had absolutely no connection with my team whatsoever, they were more than happy to see me walk out that door. I found myself without a job and with a neon green Mazda with a white racing stripe in need of a smog. <laughs> so I hit the want ads. Ultimately, I talked myself into a job as a glorified urine bottle labeler and dishwasher. <laughs> I say talked myself into because originally they were not going to give me the job. But this time I knew if I wanted that job, I needed to connect with that team. And what that team wanted was someone who would stick around long enough to be useful and not leave as soon as a greener pasture floated by. So I told my soon-to-be boss, if you hire me, I promise I will give you two full years. And he did. And I did. My new job was at a, in a section that contracted with the San Diego Police Department to test urine and blood samples for drugs, samples taken from people who had been arrested for being under the influence. About three months in, I was promoted to a chemist. A few more months, I was promoted to supervisor of the section, where it was my job to analyze the samples in the laboratory and present the evidence in court. When I realized that I could do sciencey type stuff in the lab, and then I could talk about it to a captive audience of jurors, I'm like, this is career nirvana. <laughs> and so my path was set. Many years later, I find myself in charge of the San Diego Police Department Crime Laboratory in the eighth largest city of the United States. I am part of a largely male command staff in a paramilitary organization. <clears throat> I'm part of a team who helps solve crimes, bring closure and justice to victims, exonerate the innocent. It is pretty heady stuff, but back to the bucket of body parts. In my first job, I really only came into contact with blood and urine samples, and while occasionally they were smelly, particularly all the steps where you heat up the urine, it was pretty far removed from the actual crime itself. No grieving victims, no disturbing crime scenes. When I took a job as a forensic scientist for the San Diego Police Department, however, one of my first significant cases was a grisly triple homicide where the suspect was accused of disposing of his ex-girlfriends. In a storage area near the, vic near the suspect's home, investigators found a variety of severed body parts to include severed fingers, all of which were beautifully manicured, save one. One had clearly had the nail torn from it. It was 
The investigators then found one piece of manicured nails in the suspect's home. It was my job to physically match that piece of nail back to the finger. This was grisly work. I thought, I have made a terrible career choice. <laughs> this seemed an impossible task to me. I went through a period of mild depression, you know, panic about some of the choices I'd made. Being surrounded by so much death actually spurred us to start our family earlier than planned, just to bring a little life back into my world. Ultimately, I forced myself to focus on why I was doing this work. And when I really looked at why I was doing what I was doing, and not what or how I was doing it, I made it through. I started my impossible. That clarity of purpose focused me at difficult crime scenes throughout my career. Babies and dumpsters, people who have been shot, burned, bludgeoned, stabbed to death. Clarity of purpose. When I want to inspire my team with my vision, or sway my command staff, or those associated with sometimes complicated and contradictory political construct, I start with being my authentic self. At five foot eight, I am not gonna lie, I like to wear heels. I wear them every single day. There is something so satisfying about being the tallest person in the elevator or the tallest person <laughs> in the room. When your superiors and your peers are used to being in command, taking command, giving commands, it's important to have a command presence. So I wear high heels, professional dress with a little bling to show my fun side. Mm -hmm. Well, being my authentic self is a good first step. It's also vital that I'm my most impressive self. I do not want fun relatable me to be mistaken for someone who should not be taken seriously. Therefore, I try to be the most prepared person in the room every time. If I am going to give a talk, I will crush it. If I'm going to present an idea, I will know it from every angle. And if I'm going to disagree, I will be unassailable. I believe if I present my most credible, impressive self, I will be accepted for what I bring to the table. They will trust me because I deliver, and they will believe me because I am who I am. In order to communicate that vision, I try to really connect with my audience. I have found that being a scientist in a cool and creepy, I've found the communication between a scientist in a cool and creepy field and pretty much everybody else to pose certain challenges. You know, our crime scenes are gory, heart-wrenching, or sometimes just disturbing. Our scientific techniques, esoteric and baffling. It's difficult to build a relationship with your audience when you don't speak the same language. I testified in a trial years ago, a simple under-the-influence case, where the defendant had quite a bit of methamphetamine in his bloodstream. When I testify to a jury, it is my preference to explain to them how I do my job, really educate them on how everything works and why I know it works in relatable and understandable terms. In this instance, the attorney did not want me to do that. He said, give your credentials, give the results, that's it. I testified as instructed, and he got a hung jury. You know, the jury just didn't believe in the scientific accuracy of the results. So we tried that case a second time, and this time gave me full reign to talk about how I got all my scientific answers. And this time, as you probably guessed, because I'm telling the story, <laughs> he got a conviction. You know, another way to connect with your audience is to understand their central needs. For me, that audience is often my detectives who want something from me, usually a lot of somethings, at a very unreasonable pace. Why can't you test this for DNA? Why does everything take so long? 
why can't you just do what I ask immediately? <laughs> they do not want to hear from me. I need to run the lab like a business. Make efficiency decisions. I will only test relevant items of evidence in small, reasonable batches. This was a problem for our homicide team and our laboratory. Homicide cases are a high priority for the lab. They are the most serious crimes that we have. But they also make up a very small percentage of our overall case backlog. So I meet with the homicide team routinely. I want them to know that I know how important these cases are. I want them to have some context about our overall backlog. And I want them to prioritize their cases. I tell them, hey, the lab is like a kitchen, and we only have so many ovens. I can only cook so many turkeys in those ovens. If you cram all the turkeys into one oven, nothing cooks properly. So if you want me to cook more cases, you need to downsize to game hens. <laughs> Once they have prioritized their cases, we test them ASAP. It is my goal to exceed their expectations in all the cases they deem most important. It is my goal to make sure that they know that I understand their needs. You know, communicating on a meaningful level is relevant in all areas of our lives. I am the mom of four college-age students, and I'm experiencing empty nesting for the first time this year. In some small secret place, I want my children to need me to guide them, need me to make decisions, need me to be happy. But my better self knows that if I've done my job and I've clearly communicated to them the visions and the values that have made them the amazing adults they are today, that my legacy is that they do not need me. They can stand on their own. The life, the love, the lessons I pass on to them, they'll pass on to their children and they to theirs. In my professional life, I've helped bring international accreditation to the laboratory, created a new section, helped write state law. But more importantly, I believe if I can instill in my entire team the ability to communicate vision and passion and purpose to each other and to those that come after them, then I will have created something meaningful and lasting. When I walk out the door on my last day, I want to be missed. <laughs> and in that small secret place, I hope things aren't quite as good without me. <laughs> but I know if I've done my job, they will miss me that they will be amazing without me. And that is a legacy to be proud of. <laughs>